Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing the behavior and body language of O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson was tried and acquitted for the 1994 murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. What we're going to be looking at today is an interview from 2006 about his book, If I Did It. Before we get started with this analysis, a couple of quick things. One, this is not a psychological evaluation of any kind. These are just my opinions. In addition to that, I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. So what we're looking at is an interview from 2006 that ultimately wasn't released until 2018. This interview is related to his book, If I Did It. The book was meant to describe hypothetically how he would have behaved had he actually committed these murders. The cancellation and ultimate release of the book is a long story in and of itself, and that's something that maybe you could look up, but I don't want to take up any more of your time talking about that. Let's just jump right into the interview. Um, the chapter, chapter six, is called The Night in Question. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you write in the book, now picture this and keep... Immediately as they're talking about this, you notice his hands clasped. He's starting to protect his body. The more vulnerable we are, the more open we are, the more comfortable we are. So as they're getting ready to delve into a chapter related to when he's doing a hypothetical confession, if he was talking about what he would have done, he immediately starts closing off, even though he's doing this voluntarily. Chapter six is called The Night in Question. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you write in the book, now picture this and keep in mind that this is purely hypothetical. 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 Yes. As he's saying purely hypothetical, he's closing his eyes. We oftentimes close our eyes when we're talking because we don't want to see the reaction of the person we're talking to. Maybe because we're saying something that either isn't true or we're concerned, concerned might be perceived as untrue. So maybe he thought that the interviewer did not believe that this was actually just hypothetical. In the book now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical 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 yes. why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of june 12th 1994 <laughs> and let's just walk yeah. through the night I, well first of all it's this is his body language is very interesting at this part first he moves his head back which is a way to disconnect gain a little bit of distance and then he leans forward there may be some trepidation talking about this with her because as he's going back watch this might have happened on the night of june 12th so he's leaning back. He's gaining some distance. 1994. <laughs> and now he's leaning forward, laughing and smiling. And this actually looks like a genuine smile. It doesn't look like uncomfortable laughter to me. His eyes are squinted. The corners of his mouth are way up. They're bilateral, as we say, which is they're equal on both sides of the face. This, to me, looks like a real smile. And let's just walk yeah, through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. Watch his eyebrows right here. It's very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because... He's saying because it's hypothetical, he's raising his eyebrows. That's what he wants to make sure people focus on. This is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. I know and I accept the fact that people are going to feel whatever way they're going to feel. <laughs> you know, uh, they're going to... Uh, um, so you can see him bunching up his lips right here. Oftentimes people do this as a way to punctuate what they're saying. In other words, saying I'm done with this sentence or I'm done with this thought, essentially implying he's not going to include anything else worthwhile after he's done this motion. You know, some, uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want to feel. In the book, the hypothetical is... Uh, so look at his body posture right here. On the one hand, he's leaning forward. We do that to connect. That's a very natural way to sit in interviews. He's been famous for a long time. He's used to interviews. So in that sense, he's open and he's trying to connect. On the other, he's got his hands crossed, so there's part of him that's closed off. So there must be some conflicted feelings for him talking about this. This must be some feeling vulnerable, but at the same time wanting to connect. It's a very interesting duality we're seeing right now. Charlie. Uh, uh, Pulse out. Charlie. <laughs> uh, so the hypothetical name is Charlie. Charlie is the persona, so to speak, used in this book. Now look at his reaction after he talks about Charlie. Well, it's, uh, uh, Charlie. Uh, Pulse out. Charlie. <laughs> Once again, a very genuine smile. He's shaking his head in disbelief. At least that's how I would interpret that look. So there's something that feels so ridiculous to him talking about Charlie. Uh, this guy Charlie shows up. The guy who I'd recently become friends with. And uh... Now this is also interesting. Watch the interviewer's mouth. She smiles a little bit, and I'll explain that. Uh, this guy, Charlie, shows up. The guy who had recently... So when people smile and we have good social skills, we tend to smile with them because we want to reflect that feeling. So as a good interviewer, she's probably doing that subtly as a way to continue to try to connect deeper with O.J. Simpson as they talk about this. We become friends with, and... Uh... 
I don't know why you had been by Nicole's house, but it told me you would. So you're noticing him squint right here. I don't know why you had been by. So when people do this, oftentimes we're thinking about things that we don't like or we have concern. So thinking about going by Nicole's house or trying to recall going by Nicole's house or hypothetically trying to recall it, I suppose, he's squinting in those moments because there is concern. There are thoughts that he doesn't like coming through at that time. I know Cole's house, but it told me you wouldn't believe what's going on over there. And uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop. <laughs> now, this is very interesting. You can hear he's speaking from a first-person point of view. He's talking about what I remember. Listen to this part right here. And uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop. I've never heard an interview like this before. He's basically talking about this as though it's hypothetical, but talking about it from a first-person perspective. He very quickly goes into talking about what I recall, what I remember. Never seen anything quite like it. He's also raising his eyebrows right here. This part is important to him. I'm going to go back and we can listen through it. And uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop, right? So whatever's going on over there it has to stop. So that's something that he viscerally connects with, the idea that whatever was happening, whatever was going on at that house had to stop. And he wants you to see his face. He wants to emphasize the fact that it's important to him that it stop. So we kind of hooked up together, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of broad stroking this. We go over, get into Bronco and go over. Let, let's just go back and do the details. Where did you I'm park? I'm the detail. You parked in the hypothetical. Go. So she says she wanted to go over details. I cannot understand what he says right here. I think he says he doesn't want to go over the de details. It, this is very difficult to hear. Do the details. Where did you I'm park? I'm the detail. You park in, in the hypothetical. Go in the alley. Right. You park in the alley. Yeah. And you put on a wool cap and gloves. In uh, hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Once again, the amusement comes through when he says in the hypothetical, because there's something ridiculous about the way that this is playing out. And it's hard for him, I suppose, to not see the absurdity of what's going on here. Wool cap and gloves. In uh, hypothetical. And you also see he's opening up his body as he's talking about this. As he's saying, in the hypothetical, he's opening up his body. He feels safer when he uses the words in the hypothetical. So he allows himself to be vulnerable in those moments as he talks about this under the shield of it being a hypothetical situation. Go on, put on a cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And um, you reached under the seat for... Uh, so there's a lot of feeling going on here. Watch his mouth. And, um, you reached under the seat. He's biting his lip. This is oftentimes a way to pacify or soothe ourselves when we're feeling intensely, when there's a lot of emotion coming up in order to stay stoic, in order to stay calm. We do a lot of different behaviors with our mouth. Chewing on our lip is one of them. There's lots of nerves in our mouth, so it does make us feel calmer when we do that. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on <laughs> cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And um, you reached under the seat for? Um, a knife. I always kept a knife in the car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie said, Just absolutely fascinating the way he talks about that I would always do this. He's talking about it in the first person as though he's recalling it. Not that that's a shock to anybody, but I just find it fascinating the way he's approaching this. Car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie saying, You ain't bringing that. And I didn't, right? But I believe he took it. Charlie took the knife? Yeah. So he's now leaning back. You can see he's gone from a position of comfortably sitting forward to now leaning back. As he's getting closer to talking about the actual, actual incident, we're seeing a little bit more of a disconnect here. In the book. Yeah. Yes. So the back gate, you go through the back gate. Yes. And it was open or broken or? I don't recall. Once again, the the interviewer is now saying you go through the back gate rather than Charlie went through the back gate. Just it's, it's, I, I've never seen anything quite like this. It's a fascinating interview to watch. And it was open or broken or I don't recall. And you see this, the squinting eyes, the furrowed brow. This is a look of actual concentration as he's saying, I don't recall. Okay. I go to the front and I'm looking to see what's going on. Um, and I can see that it appears like Nicole had, fly, I had candles all the time. She really 
There was another look of real concentration. You see him looking around. It seems that he's genuinely trying to recall something. This is oftentimes what people do when they are working through and processing on recalling, when they detach themselves a little bit from what's going on as they're trying to access memories. It appears like Nicole had fly. I had. So as he's trying to remember what Nicole had, he closes his eyes. This is a real look of concentration right here. And I can see that it appears like Nicole had fly. I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on. And uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. You know? So Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah. A, a, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen So as you see this squinting again, this is a look of concern. This is him connecting with feelings that he would have had or feelings that he had about this hypothetical situation. So you can see the look and the concentration on his face as he's trying to recall these details and the concern he would have felt back in that time. Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah, a, a, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. There goes the eyebrows again, to be anyone. He wants to emphasize that Ron Goldman is no one important. Really didn't recognize him. I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. To be anyone. So he wants you to hear that part. Anyone. And uh, and I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you. Now notice when he said I started having words with him, his chin tucks in. That's a defensive posture. Watch this right here. And I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. So you see this facial expression right here. Chin tucked down, looking up through the tops of his eyes. He is taking a defensive posture right here. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. Yeah, words to that effect, yes. And, and uh, he was I don't out. know if I believe it or didn't believe it. Uh, it was pretty much immaterial because, you know. Uh, so even though he's got his body closed off, he's speaking pretty comfortably, like the movements of the thumbs. He's emphasizing with that. That's not a sign that he's lying or anything like that. It's just emphasizing the story that he's telling right now. I was more concerned about everything that, that everything that was going on, you know, and uh, was uh, fed up with it, I guess. And uh, you get into a fight. There go the eyebrows again. What he wants you to hear is how fed up he is, you know, and uh, was uh, fed up with it, I guess. And uh, you get into a fight. Nicole comes out. And verbal, a verbal, a verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud and by the now this is interesting. His body has fully opened up. He's no longer got his hands crossed. So even though you would think that he would be getting more uncomfortable as he get closer to talking about the actual hypothetical murder, he's sitting with his arms much more open. He's leaning back, but he's sitting in a very comfortable position. His legs are open. He's sitting in a dominant stance right now. You can see how broad his arms are. They're sitting on the sides of the chair. So he's not only open and vulnerable, he's also domineering at this point. At that time, um uh... Uh, Nicole had come out and we started having words about who is this guy, why is he here, what's going on. And, and she says, this is my house, get that the F out yeah. of here. Yes. And uh, So if you're wondering why he's more open now than he was before, oftentimes when we get used to the nerves we're feeling, we can calm down and act a little bit more normal, act a little less defensive. So I think when he initially started talking about this process, he was feeling uncomfortable. He was feeling a little closed off. But he's getting more comfortable. He's getting more open. Which I didn't like because, once again, this is the same person. And if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating. You know? There goes the squinting again as he's talking about irritating. So that's consistent with what we saw earlier. To this that were uh, very, very irritating. You know, uh, and I think Charlie had followed this guy in, one make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. As things got heated, uh, I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, this is a real look of concentration. So he really is truly trying to recall something. He's truly trying to think through this. This looks like genuine concentration to me. Uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing, and. I and when we're recalling things, when we remember something, we tend to pantomime it a little bit when we're really emotionally connected to it. So as you can see, he's talking about this karate thing. He's moving his hands. He's getting into it as he's describing it, as he's seeing it in his mind's eye. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. 
And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around and... Um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know. So he raised his eyebrows after he said that. There's all kind of stuff around. Interestingly, he seems to want to bring attention to his face right now. We ra- I know I've talked about him raising his eyebrows quite a lot, but that's something that he does pretty consistently. And when we do that, we want people to pay attention to us. So as he's talking about this, it seems to be that he wants people to hear exactly what he's saying right now. Stuff around and... Um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know, I- so you can see when he said blood, watch this right here. What kind of stuff? Blood. So you can see he's looking away right now. Now, this is very brief, and I don't want to overemphasize when people look away, but he, this is very distinct for him. So as he was talking about blood, he looks away from the interviewer because it would be so intense to talk about that while looking them directly in the eyes. And this may be something that's just got too much emotion behind it. And, um, um... What kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know, I hate to say this, but this is... So he's laughing in a very genuine way right now. This appears to be the face of someone who is genuinely amused. Now, people can laugh uncomfortably sometimes. It tends to be a little bit briefer than this. But as he's talking about something so grave and something so awful, he does seem to be expressing some joy right here. What kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know, I hate to say this, but this is hard. <laughs> I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. That's <laughs> you know? okay. I'm going to back this... up. So it also shows that the gears are turning as he's talking about this, that the idea of saying this, maybe it brings relief. It clearly brings some degree of amusement. And maybe this is something that he's wanted to be able to say for a while. So saying this out loud seems to have brought forth a wellspring of joy from him. Maybe it's just an immense amount of relief and amusement that he's saying this in an interview. But and stuff around. You know, we, you know. I hate to say this, but this is hard. That. I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. It's <laughs> you know? okay. I want to back this up. This is hard. This is this hard. Is hard. To, I know. know. I want to back it's up hard to, to try to make people think that I'm. A... <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Um, you wrote in the book, "I had never seen so much blood in my life." Mm, yes. Now look at his chin right here. He's very open right now. This does not seem to make him feel threatened at all. Covered. You're covered. The scene. Can you just... You saw the little tongue flick right here. Watch this. Covered. You're covered. The scene. So when we do that, sometimes it's because we're getting excited. Sometimes it's because we're getting anxious. He could be feeling either one. But talking about this is bringing forth real emotion. Can you describe yeah, it? I, I, it's hard for me to describe it. I'm telling you. I don't think any two people could be... Um, Murdered the way they were without everybody been covered in blood. And of course, I think we've all seen the grisly pictures after. So, yeah, I think everything was covered, would have been covered in blood. What goes through your mind at a time like that? I don't know. It's like, uh, what happened? Mm -hmm. So you can see him pursing his lips again right there. As I've said before, there are times when we do that that's a way of punctuating what we're saying. In other words, saying, I'm not going to give you anything else of value in this right here. So when she asked that question, this is basically him signaling, I don't really have anything else I'm going to say about that. I don't know. It's like, uh, what happened? Mm -hmm. You write about removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie. Uh, you know, I had no conscious uh, memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a the glove there. And blacking out. Have you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No. Of course, you- uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your, your mind around it. It was horrible. It was absolutely hard. So we'll go ahead and stop right here. This was a fascinating and bizarre interview. In 2006, they recorded this interview with the expectation it would be released along with the launch of his book. The book was not launched at that time, so this interview didn't come out until 2018. Now, you can obviously form your own opinions. I don't imagine that what I have to say about this is going to change much of what you think about whether he did or didn't do it, but hopefully this helps you better understand some of the body language you see when you hear and see him talking about these things. 
I was sort of fascinated by this. I hope that you enjoyed this. And if you have any questions or thoughts or do you have other videos you want me to analyze, please let me know in the comments below. Last thing before we get finished up is I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right. Thanks for watching.